So preparing for the build. So this is where we get stuck in to building. Preparing the host system. Well, this Gen 2 is the host system. You can use other Linuxes, uh, other Linux distributions. I've got some videos. If you look through the play playlists on my channel, it's probably the quickest way to find a series of videos um, which shows you how to prepare other Linux systems for Linux from scratch. Um, they're not all the same. Some you need to install some other packages or configure things slightly differently. As I said before, this is one of the reasons why I use Gen 2. It just works as it is. You don't have to install anything or prepare anything. It just works. So host system requirements. This is a check to ensure that the host is actually capable of building this version of Linux from scratch. And being this is the, well, it's not the latest version of the live GUI from Gen 2. It's about a month old, but it should still be new enough. Um, in fact, I would have thought that any distribution in the last few years should be perfectly fine for building Linux from scratch. This does also check, apart from versions, it checks that some sim links are set up. Um, some distributions don't use Bash by default, for example. Um, and it also checks that the compiler can actually compile as well. So um, it checks you have actually got a compiler that's operational. So what I should do is get a terminal up. Um, now tip here is to ensure that the terminal has got at least 80 characters on the display because um, some packages may not compile or, or the tests may fail if you haven't got 80 characters. And certainly when we come to configure the kernel, the um, script, the menu config script will not run unless it's in a terminal that's got the least 80 characters. Um, so what we can do here is to uh, get rid of that, is to go to the settings and configure console and then profiles, create a new profile go to appearance and then miscellaneous and there's an option here to display vertical line at a certain column number so it defaults to 80 so that's good and if we click apply that will set that um, and I'll also change the fonts as well so let's try size uh, 13 And then I'll set that one as a default. So if I get rid of that, do a new tab. Yeah, you can see there's the line indicating the 80 columns. So this, I can actually make the font slightly bigger. So let's just modify it and change it up to 14. Just to make it easy to read on the video and it also helps my eyes. So I want to edit the default one, edit, appearance, miscellaneous, and sorry, no, it's the font size I want. Let's change that to 14. And by default, it shows the mono spaced fonts, which is definitely what you want. You don't want any proportional space fonts. Right, this bus is quite hard to navigate. Right, hopefully that won't be too big. Yep, that's already changed. So the 80 columns is nearly off the screen, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, in fact, I could just shrink that to there. Expand that a bit, that'll be good. Okay, so we've got to check these versions of these key packages. So these are the, like the core packages we need to start the build of Linux from scratch. And they've got a script here to check these versions. And they've also modified the script recently so that it, 
it does the checking itself so it, it takes a, a lot of the error out of checking because sometimes the versioning can be a little bit confusing when you look at it initially um, and as you can see it's reported okay on every line where it's done a check if there are any problems I think it prints up error yes it does there we go um, so if it doesn't find something as it should it prints up error in place of okay so as you can see we've got all the packages available and they all meet the versioning requirements the sim links are installed for these three packages and the uh, G++ compiler works as well and then it's reporting that NPROC is reporting 16 logical cores available for compiling so that means that um, any packages that can, can compile in parallel will be able to do so with at least 16 jobs running con concurrently so we're all set to go uh, again another summary of what happens in the chapters so the next thing we've got to do is to create some partitions so this machine normally I build Linux from scratch um, as simply as possible so that's with system 5 system V um, which is simpler than installing system D it's also still the, the default Linux from scratch pro project um, I normally install using a BIOS boot, not a UEFI boot, again because it's simpler. To install with a UEFI boot we have to go off to uh, Beyond Linux from Scratch to install a few packages from that in the middle of Linux from Scratch. And the configuration is slightly different as well, it's a little bit more complex for um, UEFI. However, unfortunately this machine can only boot using UEFI. So I will be installing Linux from scratch 12.2 using UEFI. Um, so it makes the build a little bit longer. And I've got to keep my wits about me because I'm not so used to building with UEFI as I am with uh, a BIOS boot. So um, let's read about this here. Um, so it explains a minimal system requirement requires a partition of about 10 gigabytes. That's enough to store all the source tables and compile the packages. Um, and as it says there, if you tend to keep it as a primary Linux system, you'll probably need a lot more. So they're recommending 10 gigabytes, which is, yeah, high degree, probably the absolute minimum. Um, you'd probably want at least 16, I'd say, just to give yourself a bit of wiggle room. Um, it mentions about swap space and to use these programs here to partition. So it doesn't explicitly give any information about preparing the disk, so I'll be going through that. And probably the reason is because there could be several combinations of configuration, um, even different hardware. So the instructions would have to cater for many different permutations. So the root partition, we need somewhere to store the system and we need a swap partition in case we run out of memory. The swap partition can take any spillover from uh, the memory when it's full. Although like it says, swapping is never good for mechanical drives. You'll hear the disk rattling around and the machine will slow down considerably. Even with SSD, you can notice pauses. Um, but of course, SSD um could uh, be under threat of being worn out if you're continually reading and writing memory contents to it so it's not a good idea and as it says if swapping becomes a normal occurrence the best solution is to purchase more ram for your system if that's possible if the boot disk has been partitioned with a GUID partition table then a small typically one meg partition must be created if it does not exist so this is only if you are booting with the BIOS boot. Um, if you're booting um, with a GPT partition table on a UEFI boot, you don't need this um, BIOS partition. 
So it mentions there several other partitions are not required but should be considered when designing a disk layout. Following this is not comprehensive, comprehensive but it's meant as a guide. So a separate boot partition, um, an EFI partition, which it says to read the BLFS page. So let's get that up as well. That might give us some pointers as to how we should design our layout. So it's telling us there about some kernel settings that we'll have to build into the kernel when we come to build that. So that's worth knowing. Creating an emergency disk. I don't see any point in that because we've booted from a live GUI. But the information is there if you do want to build your own one. Um, on EFI based systems, bootloaders are installed in a special FAT32 partition called the EFI system partition. If your system supports EFI and a recent version of some Linux distribution or Windows pre-installed, it's like the ESP has been created. So if I run that command, you'll see at the moment there's nothing on the disk. I've got an empty disk because I'm starting from scratch. Um, okay, so I need to become the root to do that. <clears throat> um, okay, so what we've got here is yeah, the reason why that's failed is because, not because I wasn't root, it's because I've got an NVMe drive, a flash drive. So if I do that, you can see it's empty. Okay, so that's all about installing it. So we've got to make sure that we create a partition for the EFI called... Um, EFI system. Um, home directory can be separate user opt temp and user source. So they're just some indicating indications of how the disk could be partitioned. And then it goes on to creating a file system partition. So um, Let's have a think how we're going to do this. Let's go into fdisk into that device. So this allows me to modify the partitions on the disk. And you can see by default it's created a DOS type partitioning system, which I call a disk label. So we need to change that to a GUID type layout because we're using UEFI. So if I do M for the menu, you can see there's a, an option here to create a new label, so a new partition table. Uh, and there's an option there to create one with an empty GPT partition table. So that's the option I'm going to choose because I don't want to use the DOS one. And now you can see it says created a new GPT disk label. Now there's two ways of creating the boot partition. And the, well, in fact, there's three ways actually. Um, Generally, you you can, if you're not using the UFI, you can just make the boot partition just a directory under the, on the root. I like to create it as a separate directory um, purely because you don't need it mounted when you're using a system. So it just protects the boot files and being there quite critical uh, files to get the machine to boot. It is probably best not to have the boot partition mounted and therefore it needs to be separate. Same thing goes for the EFI uh, partition. Um, it's probably a good idea to have that separate. Now whether the boot partition and the EFI partition are separate or the same uh, is down to you. I, I, I've done both in the past. I've had a, an EFI partition and just put the kernel images on, on that EFI partition. Um, and likewise, I've also had a separate boot partition with the EFI partition dangling off that boot partition. Um, now that allows me to have a boot partition formatted as EXT uh, because the fact uh, the uh, EFI partition must be formatted as FAT32. So it means if you share the boot and the EFI partition, it means that the boot files have got to reside on the FAT32 partition, on the EFI partition. Um, 
So I think I'm going to tend to create separate partitions. It just makes it a little bit more complicated, um, but it does keep different file systems se separate and segregated. So let's create a new partition. First one, first sector, um, and the last sector. Well, we don't know what the last sector is, but I do know that I want to make this EFI partition the um, about 500 megabytes, I think, should be sufficient. So I'll create that with 500 meg. So if I put a plus in front of that, it means add or extend this partition to 500 megabyte boundary and it calculates the last sector automatically. And as you can see, it's created the partition Linux file system and size of 500 megabytes. Now, as I said, this is going to be the EFI system. And if you remember on the BLFS web page, it said that that type should be or should read EFI system. So we need to change that type. So to do that, we type in T to change the type. And then it says type in the type or the alias or L to list them all. So I can't remember what number, well, I do know what number it is. But if, for example, we don't know what number it is, we can type L to list all the different types. And you can see straight away the top one is the type we need, EFI system. So you can either press enter there or space bar to get the remainder of the list, or you can press Q to exit immediately. So it comes back and asks us again what partition type we want. We want number one, and there you go. Let's change it to EFI system, just as it says on the BLFS page. So that's all good. So we can now do P to print out the layout. And as you can see, we've got the uh, first partition of the NVMe uh, disk. It's 500 megabytes, and it's set to the EFI system. So the next thing I want to do is to create the boot partition. So just take the next partition, start the next available sector, and I want to create this one as 250 megabytes. And as you can see, it says it's created a Linux file system, size 250 meg. I don't need to change this type because it will be a Linux file system when it's formatted. Uh, so that's fine. So let's do P again to see what we've got so far. So partition two is the Linux file system, which is going to be the boot, so it's a small partition. Next, I'm going to create a swap partition. So this is the next partition three. Take the next available sector. And then I want this partition to be, say, two gigabytes. Um, how big you make this swap partition is a bit of a point that's up for debate really it depends on how much memory you've got if you've got very little memory you might want a bigger swap drive but as we saw before if you're swapping you probably need to purchase if you're swapping a lot you probably need to purchase more memory if you can um, there's been recommendations about creating swap twice the size in memory well this has got 128 gigabytes do I really want a 256 gigabyte um, swap partition that would be ridiculous to swap that amount of space all the time um, so I tend to tend to on smaller uh, machines with smaller amounts of memory I tend to just give enough swap to ensure that packages will compile even if they do get to swap. So for example, um, some of the large packages, especially in BLFS, will need two gigabytes per core. So I'd be looking at needing 32 gigabytes on this machine, being as it's got 32. Uh, sorry, 16. Um, logical cores um, and as it's got plenty of memory well above that I don't really need any swap but it's always a good good idea to have a little bit of swap so I think I'm going to carry a two gigabyte swap uh, so plus two gig um, as it's just purely a spillover it's just something that warn me if I notice something slowing down then I know that um, all the memory is used up, it might be something that's leaking and taking all the memory or maybe running too many processes at once, something like that. It's unnecessary to have anything bigger, you know, even, even one gigabyte may be sufficient. Um, 
Um, in fact, yes, I think I will create just one with one gigabyte. Come to think of it, so I'll delete that partition three and recreate it. First sector plus one gig. And there it is created with Linux file system as the type. So again, I don't want to keep that as Linux file system. I want to change that type to reflect the fact that it's a swap partition. And it's partition number three. I want to adjust L to list the partitions. And I want to look for one where it says swap. There it is there, Linux swap. So I need to type in 19. So I'll press Q there, type 19 in, and you can see it's changed to Linux swap. Do P again, and you can see that's there. Finally, I need to create the actual root partition where all the files in the system will reside. So the fourth partition, take the first sector, and I'll just press enter to accept the last sector, and that will take up the remainder of the disk, the remainder of what's available. It's already set it to Linux file system. So I'll just print that up, and you can see that's all the partitions we'll be using. Now, um, when you go to change a type, for example, I'll use four, get the list of partitions. You'll notice there is um, a Linux root for a 32-bit system and the Linux root option for a 64-bit system and other architectures. It's not necessary to change um, to those partition types specifically. Um, I can't remember the exact circumstances, but I think there are some systems that would actually use that um, as an identif identification of how to boot, um, but it's generally not necessary. Just using the um, default option 20, the Linux file system is fine. It's no, there's no need to change that at all. Um, can I press Control C there? Yeah. Okay, I didn't want to change that at all. So there's my partition layout. I'm going to press W now, which will write the contents of that partition layout to the disk. And it's been done. So I can now do fdisk minus L slash dev slash NVMe. That's already got it in there. Zero N1. And there it is all retained on the disk. So the next thing we've got to do is to create the file systems on those partitions. So what we've done is we've created the containers on the disk. We now need to format those partitions. So the first one is the EFI partition, which we need to format as um, a VFAT partition. So there's no information here about... how to format that here but hopefully I can remember we need to use mkfs dot vfat I think it is yep and then we need to use a minus capital F32 option and that tells it to format using 32 30, is it 32 kilobyte blocks? I think it is, or 32 bit blocks. I can't remember exactly, but it's. Um, let's look up the man page for this and it will tell us. Uh, okay. Let's try VFAT. No. Um, what else could you have? I know what I'll do. I'll go to the let's do mkfs.vfat minus f32. See what that comes up with. Okay, so all oh, right. Okay, so it's um, mkfs vfat eight. So that's why I couldn't find it. It's no vfat one. So that's okay. Right, okay, there it is there. So the capital F means the fat size. So yes, it's the number of bits that the fat will use. So by default, it uses 16, but we need to be using 32 bits. So mkfs.vfat minus f32 
and we want to format this partition here so I'll double click that to highlight it to ensure that I don't make any typos center click the mouse button paste that in and press enter and that's formatted that partition with the FAT32 partition so the next one I need to do is to format the boot partition so I'll use this just copy that so this is make a file system use V to be verbose T is the type of uh, file system and I want to format the boot partition that's done and I'll do the same thing on the root partition which is partition number four and you can see that takes a little bit longer because it's a lot lot bigger and then I need to create the swap partition as well it's just to write a signature rather than to actually format it so let's copy that designation which is that one and that's the swap created so I'll move on and we've got something here called setting the LFS variable so the LFS variable is used as a reference to the mounted partition where we build the initial LFS system and it's quite important because we'll be running commands in the host system but these commands have got to be applied to this LFS the location specified with by the LFS variable because that's where the root partition will be located of the new LFS system and if this if this LFS variable is not set correctly we could end up writing or overwriting stuff on the host system which is not what we want so it's important to have this set and to ensure it's set correctly at all times so there may be times where um, the book reminds us to check it or you might want to check before you do something just to be sure that the command you type using this variable will actually put the contents of the command at the correct location and as it says here do not forget to check that LFS is set whenever you enter or or re-enter the current working environment so if you log out and you log back in again check to see whether it's active or not and if it isn't you need to activate it with that export command and it says to one one way to ensure it's always active is to put it in the bash profile of the user that you're in being this is a live GUI it's probably not worth it because all the settings we make will just get lost um, so that's yeah, probably worth doing if you're building Linux from scratch on a on a system that's got persistence. So now we're going to mount the new partition. So first of all, we're going to create the location at that location in the LFS. So at the moment, we've got a mount directory, but nothing in it. As you can see, oh well, there's a Gen2 directory in there. What this command will do is create an LFS directory in that location. And there it is. And then we're going to mount the root file system at that location. So we'll just replace this with NVMe 0 um, N1. And our roots file system will be p4 and that's mounted so now if I do df df minus h you can see that that partition 4 which was the big one 443 gigabytes is available so that is a good little check to make sure that the correct partition has been mounted um, if you're using multiple partitions for example one for the root one for home and mount them like this well, yes, we've got two extra partitions. We've got the boot partition and the EFI partition, but I'm not going to mount them until we come to that part of the book because it should tell us to mount them at that point. So I'll leave them unmounted at the moment. Um, the above instructions assume that you will not restart your computer throughout the LFS process. If you shut down your system, you'll either need to remount the LFS partition each time and it says here to make this persistent you can add it to the etc fs tab so that, that partition is mounted 
Um, but again, because we're on live um, media, any changes we make is just going to get lost. So now we are going to activate the swap, although it's not going to be used or very unlikely to be used. Occasionally you get a few megabytes that are used through natural use, um, whether it's programs that specifically want to use a bit of swap or there is indeed something in the memory that the Linux kernel thinks doesn't need to be in the memory and it just puts it on swap. Um, I don't know, but there is, are occasions where you might see the odd megabyte being used, even though you've got gallons of memory. So we want to use the third partition, which is our swap partition. Uh, NVMe. That one there. So there you are, you can see it's found it and it's activated it. We can just type swap on to view that, or you can even do cat forward slash proc forward slash swaps. And that also shows the same or similar sort of information. So now that the new LFS partition is open for business, it's time to download the packages. So 